I'm really excited to introduce Andrea Newton today. Andrea is a woman on a mission to get people talking, to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and make a positive difference in the world. And today we're going to be talking about a subject that people really find difficult. They don't like hearing about it. They don't like talking about it. Um, they have very strong views about it quite often. And we are going to be talking about it. And so I think sometimes uh, people have their own perceptions about it, which may not be right. But before we do that, I'm going to hand over to you, Andrea, so you can tell people more about you. Okay, thank you, Wendy. So as you say, my, my name's Andrea Newton, and I've been working in the corporate world for well, two years now, which, which actually that can't be true because I am only 21, um, maybe in my mm -hmm. head. But as you say, I'm a woman on a mission. Um, I believe that we need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and have conversations that matter combination of my um, corporate experience along with my own personal lived experience is kind of what brings me to this place to really encourage people to have those crucial conversations. Great. Yeah, mental health is, is one of them that people don't like talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and people do have very strong views about it. But equally, I think the one about suicide, mm. that is a really, really tricky one. Yeah. And I've, I've been there several times yeah. and I've also, you know, now I work with, with people who are struggling with suicidal ideation or who have attempted it or are contemplating it, etc. Mm. Um, so, yes, I do have some experience of it. But yeah. Andrea, let's talk about this subject. Mm. It's, you know, as you say, it is a very sensitive subject. And so people don't talk about it. Um, and actually, Wendy, that's part of the problem because people don't talk about it. The silence that sits around it is actually a massive contributing factor because at the end of the day, you know, it's just another human condition. Mm -hmm. If I had a migraine or if I had a, an abscess under my tooth, if I was in physical pain, I would have absolutely no issue in seeking out the help that I need that would help me resolve that pain. And, you know, you and I and you and anybody else, really, we could have that conversation quite comfortably without any shame because people realize that if I've got a migraine, it's not something that I've created myself. And equally, that's, you know, that's how it should be when we're talking about our mental health. And also, you know, as you said, the, the, the thorny subject of, of suicide which is a subject that I talk about every day of the week and um, you know really want to encourage other people to recognize that talking about it is actually the way that we're going to resolve it. Mm. I, I so agree with you and I think people people feel that it, it's a determined a determined attempt to end their life mm. but what they don't appreciate is that it's not about that i don't think that people no. want to die if, no. if they want to escape from the extreme emotional or physical pain that they're suffering yeah and typically from um as you know i'm, I'm a tutor qualified to deliver now suicide intervention training and we know as part of the evidence-based research we know that people aren't typically thinking about dying or ending their life what they're looking to do is as you say escape from the pain now that pain could be physical pain if it's somebody living with an illness or a disease or a you know a, mm. a life-changing injury but that pain could also be emotional psychological and you know we we absolutely need to recognize that suicide ideation isn't just because you know isn't because someone's mentally ill Mm. You know, not everyone with a mental illness will have thoughts of suicide and equally not everyone who has thoughts of suicide is mentally ill. Mm. Um, more often than not, it's simply people who are overwhelmed by life circumstance. And, you know, who are you or I to judge whether they should be overwhelmed? 
You know, we, mm. we're never going to have the same unique combination of that person's biology, psychology, past history, current life. So who are we to say whether they they should or should not be feeling that way? Just as you wouldn't judge me as to whether I should or should not have a migraine. Mm. Yeah, um, and that's it. I think people either get dismissed or, mm. well, they've got nowhere to go. How can you admit that life is too much? And I think for those that... I know when I've spoken to clients sometimes, they've, when they've shared it, the other person has taken it on themselves. You're being selfish or mm. um, you, it, they, t they, they think it's something they've done wrong instead of being there for the person who's feeling that desperate. Absolutely. And, you know, that that word selfish, I, it really just rankles when I hear that word, because we know that one of the contributing factors um, is actually people feeling as though they are a burden to others. Mm. And so they, they perhaps see the, the suicide as a way of relieving the burden on their family or their friends. Um, you know, I know of a situation of, of a guy who was ex-military and as a veteran came back with symptoms of PTSD, which mm. meant that for him, he was waking up with, um, you know, horrific nightmares, memories, flashbacks, screaming in the middle of the night, which in mm. turn disturbed his, his children, his family. And so he felt that, you know, his kids shouldn't be subject to that, seeing daddy distressed and in such a way. So his decision wasn't about being selfish. His decision mm. was about protecting his children from growing up with that experience in their lives so you know when we talk about selfish and and sometimes we'll hear people say it's the coward's way out actually you know it takes an incredible amount of courage to fight against our inbuilt survival mechanism yeah so it, it's not about um, being selfish it's not about being a coward it's about being in a place where it's just so overwhelming that you no longer feel that you have the capacity to cope. And often people who are feeling hopeless, people who feel worthless, um, mm. people who feel as though they are a burden to others. Those are the three factors that we hear most often um, associated. Yes, and I, what came to mind at that point was the other thing that people get accused of. Mm. Even by, I'm going to say professionals, but certain mm. professionals, is mm. it's attention seeking. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know what? If I'd got a migraine and I sought your attention for help with my migraine, would you dismiss me quite so casually? Probably not. You'd probably start rooting around in your handbag, trying to find some painkillers and suggesting perhaps homeopathic ways, or you might talk about my diet or my lifestyle to help me with my migraine. You yeah. wouldn't say to me, stop seeking attention and just crack on with it. You can, you know, you're, you're just being ridiculous, which unfortunately is sometimes the narrative that people with suicide ideation may hear. Yeah. Not, you know, often it's not because somebody's being deliberately nasty or, you know, isn't a kind person. It's almost because people are afraid of the subject. People don't know how to deal with it. People don't know how to talk about it. And so how do I stop my own discomfort is actually by getting you to, to shut up. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things I notice is that um, there is a particular questionnaire that is used um, and, and in it, it's about anxiety and depression questionnaire. Mm. And in it, I, um, have you got thoughts to, you know, to end your life or, or harm others, harm yourself or others? And the risk assessment that goes with it is, if they say yes, okay. So the risk assessment is, if they've made a plan, and that means that they are closer to it than mm. they're not. Now, on the occasions when I've actually taken action, I didn't have a plan. Mm. I actually was so desperate at that point. The first time I can share with you, I was about 13. Mm. I was so unhappy. I couldn't, I craved the attention of my mother. I couldn't get through to her. 
I sat there and sobbed and I just I met with a blank wall. It wasn't the first time this was mm. continual. And in the end, I just turned on the gas fire in the sitting room. And she came in and turned it off immediately and said, have you no thoughts that the budgery girl's in here? Oh. Wow. Um, there was no consoling me whatsoever. Yes, I was seeking her attention. I wanted her love. Mm. Mm. And, and the second time, I, re I recall, I'm sure there were more than one, but I was in a, an abusive relationship and I just sat at my dressing table with all my pills in front of me. I had no, no plan about it at all. Mm. And it was just, what, I'm gonna take all of these. I cannot, I can't cope anymore. Mm. And he just turned around and said, well, if you do it, I'll do it. Like, mm. So it, it, what you know, I stopped myself, but it was because I thought of my family. I did, you know, what, yeah. Yeah. what there are other, but what I suppose I wanted to point out is that that plan isn't always there. No, and, and that's where sometimes the risk assessments can mean that people fall between the gaps, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we've all seen some horrific stories who people were considered um, not ill enough or not mm. of a significant enough danger, etc. Um, and so we always take the view that every situation is potentially a genuine situation. And it's not about ticking all the boxes so that we can then, you know, sort of address it as such. Mm -hmm. It really is about understanding that if that person is feeling in, you know, in that way, in crisis or indeed, you know, I, I often use the word overwhelm because mm -hmm. my own situation, that's how I describe it, feeling completely overwhelmed by everything that, that was going on. But, you know, if a person is in that place, <laughs> who the hell am I to judge whether you tick enough boxes you know it's like me saying I'm sorry you can only do trauma in this way and unless mm. you tick all these boxes you're you're not experiencing trauma you know who are we to to determine what that is but equally I do have some sympathy with you know parts of the the medical profession if you like because um for one thing they're not routinely trained in suicide intervention which just scares the pants off me and I just think it's it's so very wrong mm. um and also you know let's be honest we've got lots of systems that have been under-resourced and overstretched for such a long time um you know that perhaps people are not getting the care that they really need yeah. And that's something else that, you know, that does concern me, because sometimes when you're in that place, standing up for yourself and fighting to be heard and getting an appointment with the right people, that just takes so much energy and effort that actually right now I just don't have. Mm. And so, you know, there's, there's so many things that contribute to this, but um, the, the whole risk assessment piece, you know, if we start to just look at statistics, the risk is we get caught up in the middle aged men between 45 to 49 because they're the highest risk, they're the highest number of deaths by suicide in the UK, etc. But by focusing on that, we're missing the fact that the biggest increase in recent years has actually been young females between the ages of 16 and 24. Mm. So the, the more standard risk assessment, tick enough boxes before we'll listen, actually means that people are falling through the gaps. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a very narrow way of looking at things anyway, as you mm. say, it, it's, it's not at all helpful. No. Um, and I think sometimes we can't, you know, I, I, as much as we don't want somebody to end their life, take their life, prematurely we're never going to be able to stop someone if they feel that, that no. badly and determined no um all we can do is be there for them mm -hmm. but i you know i've i've had clients that i still don't know whether they will or not mm. you know past clients yeah and i would never say it's wrong to do it mm. if life is so awful and you can find no way out. Wendy, there is always a way. <laughs> there is. There, there is. But if that, if that person just feels, I mean, yes, I'm not saying people shouldn't yeah. seek help. 
but I just feel I, I don't like that the judgment on totally people. absolutely and that's the bit I'm getting at yeah. not that there yeah. is no way out. Yeah, it's no. that view. I'm oh, sorry. I maybe it didn't make it very clear. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. I was just thinking because um, when we train on suicide intervention, we absolutely respect that that person has that choice, and what we are asking them to do in that moment is simply to press pause. Yes. And in pressing pause to explore whether there are indeed other alternatives. You know, both you and I have been in that place where we believe that that was the next step. But equally, here we are today. And, you know, it really is just about pressing pause and finding the help that helps you. And that will be different for everybody. You know, not everybody needs a referral to a GP with a prescription. Some people need help that's much more practical, you know, perhaps dealing with debt or um, somebody Mm. who's dealing with a a very difficult divorce, for example. You know, so it might be about that person needing practical help. But you're absolutely right to say, you know, we have to respect that everybody has that choice. Mm. But I guess the more open we are, the more we talk about it, the more people will be aware that there may indeed be another alternative that, you know, they hadn't considered. Um, you know, as, as far as I was concerned, I'd blocked out everything in my world. I had no thought for my son or my family or anything like that. Um, and it just took a really random conversation for me to start thinking, you know, maybe there is an alternative. Mm. And I think the more we talk about people feeling this way and the more we, you know, sort of change the narrative that actually, if that is how you're feeling, it's okay to say. And let's see if we can't help you get the help you need, whatever form that help may be. And, you know, the work that I do isn't about training people to become that help. You know, it isn't about people being counsellors or therapists or even mental health experts. It's simply as a decent human being, having the courage to have a conversation that helps somebody access the help they need. Exactly. And I think when the people generally, if they hear someone saying, I don't want to live or I'm going to end my life or I've, mm. I hate that term committing suicide mm. because yeah, that, no. that is not no. a good term at all. No. Uh, and that isn't language that we would encourage. No. I mean, you know, the, the whole commit connects it with crimes. And yeah. Suicide hasn't been a crime in the UK since 1961. So it's time we change that language. And also we know that people who've been, you know, lost somebody, people who are bereaved by suicide, they often find that term offensive. So, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. We don't talk about it in that no, way. I that. But I think it is the more, it is very scary when you hear someone yeah. talking about sure. how it's in my life. For sure. But I think how, how we deal with it, how, what do we do when we hear someone saying that? rather than being frightened because I think mm. I, I remember the even though I've, I've made attempt but you know tried to, to end my life myself before um when I first heard that first client say that mm. I was scared yeah yeah absolutely but when you sit when I've sat with somebody just being able for them to say just talk about it indeed. and not react indeed not not yeah not react I think that's the biggest thing mm. I'm sorry you hear, feel like that tell me more about it be inquisitive or what what's legislative or how you're feeling it's that because yep. what do you need right now yeah. all of those things I think if you could stay in that place mm. when someone says it yeah. That is the biggest thing you can do for anybody. For sure, because it's almost as though if I can get those thoughts out of my head and actually when those words meet oxygen, it sometimes just relieves the intensity and can almost help us in a way get a bit of perspective. 
because I do believe that as a human being, if we've got thoughts just going round and round in our heads, we can sometimes blow them out of proportion. Mm. And I don't, you know, necessarily mean in this case, but even everyday simple, trivial issues, you know, I need two new tires on my car, but I'm not going to get paid for another two weeks and I won't be able to get to the garage because of my working hours. But what if I get pulled over in the meantime? And before we know it, we've turned, um, you know, a sort of an everyday domestic issue into a big deal. Mm. And so actually, sometimes just being able to talk about how you're feeling to somebody without judgment without criticism and without any of that toxic positivity you know that oh it'll be fine honestly you see it'll all come out in the wash or clearly if you're a northerner you know it's about having a cup of tea and a Kit Kat it's it's kind of stepping away from that and actually if this is how that person is feeling, telling them it'll be fine. Again, all you're doing is saying, oh, you're just being silly, but you're just, yeah. you know, you're using other language. So, I, I, you know, exactly as you said, I'm really sorry to hear that's how you're feeling. Do you want to talk to me about what it is that's, that's going on for you that's making you feel this way? Not so that I can fix it, not so that I oh, become no, no, no. Your, your therapist or, you know, there's people f- far more qualified to, to do that job, Wendy. Um, but about saying, you know, let's talk about it. And then maybe if I understand what it is that's making you feel this way, maybe I can help you access the help you need. Perhaps that's my role is, is you know, to help you connect with mm. the right people, the right support, the right organizations mm. to, you know, sort of help you unpick all of that stuff that's underlying. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is the biggest thing is, is for that person to feel heard yeah. and not dismissed and not judged and sure. not being fixed. For sure. And not just, dis- yeah, absolutely. Because that's what they need. Mm. Whether as you say whether it it is that attention seeking or whether it is just sheer overwhelm and distress and just just not being able to cope anymore Mm. but they need someone just to be there yeah and you know I was so lucky I had three women and um, my own son who became such a fantastic scaffold for me. I refer to them as my, you know, some people talk about a social network. I talk about a social scaffold. Um, Mm. And actually those three ladies were never in the same room as me. You know, one was in North Wales, one was down in Kent, and the other was actually on the South Coast in France. But between them, because I knew that I could talk openly and honestly about what was going on for me and about the thoughts I was having, It was just a way of getting it out of my system, yeah. you know, and just to have somebody say, how are you feeling today? And really mean it, you know, not that social interchange that we all do. (laughs) Hiya, you're all right, I'm all right. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. It's it's not about that. It's actually about thinking that somebody else gives a damn. And, you know, I was very lucky with, with the three ladies. And as I say, my son was an absolute star. So... Um, Mm. talking about it absolutely does matter and it's so important yeah Um, I I couldn't agree more like you know I we both experience it from both ends and I just think it is that situation of yeah what what you need what what Mm. is it you need and and it is being heard and another human cares yeah absolutely they really care like you say and I think every conversation I have with a client is, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Mm. And it's it, <laughs> many, many years ago, decades ago, you see, how do you do? That would be yes. <laughs> how you, but I, I, you know, I always check and say, yeah, okay. Well, we've done that. We've done that social introduction. Yeah, now, how are now, how, you? How are you really? So instead how of, are you you really? know, instead of how do you do, how do you be? How do you be today? yeah how are you being how are you feeling what's going on it's very different and you know that kind of conversation there's a big difference between listening to understand and listening to reply yes um you know and and that's one of the things that I do try to encourage in in the work that I do because listening to reply the agenda is still partially yours and what do I need to say next how do I need to represent myself how do I need to come back to that But listening in order to understand is about saying, okay, let me really hear what's going on for you. 
And, you know, sometimes people may suggest something that we might think is, is quite trivial. We might think, why would they be, you know, I remember once somebody saying to me that they were surprised that their neighbour had taken her life because her cat had died and they didn't feel that, mm-hmm. you know, that was. And actually, the conversation we had was, do you know what? Chances are losing the cat was the final piece mm-hmm. You know, it's and we don't often get to having thoughts of suicide as a result of a one off event. It's typically a combination of factors that build up. And I sometimes explain it to people as being the difference between the big log that jams the system as opposed to thousands of little splinters that together Mm. make that jam happen. Um, You know, and and things like the cat could well have just been the final loss, the final piece of grief for that person. And, you know, as I say, who the hell am I to judge? Because I don't know your past. I don't know your biology, your psychology, all of those factors that can contribute, Mm -hmm. you know, in that quite complex way. So it's about acknowledging that if that's what it is for them, that's what it is for them. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I think it is about, as you say, it's that sense of not being alone, that Mm. that there is somebody that will listen, that somebody is prepared to listen, not judge. Yep. And I think if we can do that for another human being, Mm. and then we may need to get other support and help for that person. Indeed. We may need that support and help. What do I do right now? Mm, For Um, sure. Because my, my friend, my my father, my son, my whoever, has said they, they want to end their life. I yeah. don't know where to go and what to okay. do. And, and you talked about you have a handout. Yeah, there's there's lots of resources. I mean, I'm, I've been really lucky. This last um, couple of months, for example, I've been rolling out a project um, across Greater Manchester. And what I've discovered that I had no idea about before is that there are literally hundreds of little organisations, be they voluntary, be they charities, whatever, who are supporting people in all different areas from um, someone who might be alcohol dependent, someone who may be a refugee, somebody who's at risk of being homeless, you know. And so I've started to put together a pack of really useful resources. And obviously, I've put together the ones that we know now nationally um, with an encouragement that people also add to that resource and become more aware of local um, support services I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the the system if you like is perfect because we know it isn't but what I am going to tell you is that there are lots there's lots of help and support out there if you know where to find it And so my really useful resources is about everybody being aware of where we can signpost people to. And exactly as you said, and also know where to get support myself. You know, Mm. for example, if I am a parent, there's organisations like Young Minds, Student Minds, Papyrus, who can offer support to me just as much as, you know, to, to my child. And the more we are aware of the different resources, the more we're able to signpost people and tap into the right help, the more able we are to make that difference. But in order to signpost people to the right place, we've got to have the courage to have the conversation in the first place so that we understand the nature of the help that that person needs. Yes, exactly. And I think sometimes people feel so helpless. They feel if they, if they, talking to somebody who is that desperate or overwhelmed they want to avoid it because they think I don't know where to go I don't know what to do indeed and I think the more the resources out there the the better because it is well yeah but I I I'm not an expert you need to go and talk to someone else okay but the thing is you can actually if you've got those resources you can say right um I need to speak to somebody because I know some you know I've got somebody in my life who is feeling like this and I think that or I can signpost that person yeah but you know we we don't even need to know exactly where to signpost them to what we need to be willing to do is to work with them to help them find it yeah You know, so that might be about me saying to you, look, Wendy, you know, I can hear that you're really struggling. And off the top of my head, I don't know where the best place is for you to get some help. But I tell you something, I'm here to help you find it. Let's have a look together. Yeah. 
you know and sometimes it's just about that there's a fantastic website called the hub of hope and mm. just by putting your postcode in there that brings up different resources that are available in your immediate postcode area mm. so you you don't have to be the expert what you do have to be is a decent human being who's willing to help somebody access whatever the help is that they need and to let them know that you're willing to support them in doing that. You know, people say to me, oh, I'd, I'd be scared about the conversation because I wouldn't know what to say. I'd be frightened of saying the wrong thing. I wouldn't have the solution. And actually, you don't need any of that. Mm. You need a combination of compassion and curiosity. Yeah. Compassion in as much as you care enough to want to help genuinely but curiosity that you're prepared to ask questions so that you understand what's going on for that person mm. and therefore the best help that you can be, whether it's about advocating for that person, whether it's about signposting them or whether it's simply about saying, I'm here, you can talk to me. Yeah, exactly. We don't have to be an expert to make a difference. We no, just no. have to be a decent human being. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Oh, so um, what is one thing that people can take away today? What would you, I mean, you've, you've offered already a lot. I think you'd be a decent <laughs> human being. But have you got something else that people could just take with them? I, I think for me, the, the really important thing is to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. So often in life, not just around suicide, but so many things, we avoid difficult conversations. And actually, the discomfort of the conversation is probably tiny compared to the potential consequences of that conversation not being had. And that's whether you're in the workplace, that's whether you're a manager managing a team, that's whether it's your friend that's having, you know, difficult thoughts. We've got to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah, right. I'm going to put all the details, all your details, all your contact details and so on, and the link to the um, resources you talked about, your handout. But what is one easy way for listeners to get in contact with you? The easiest way is via the website, which is called confidentconversations.co.uk. And if you go to the Confident Conversations website, that's where you'll find the, the download of the really useful resources and an opportunity to find out more about the seven significant conversations that I help people to have. That's brilliant. Thank you so much today, Andrea. Thank you for opening up and sharing your experiences and also, um, yeah, having that difficult conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. Very welcome.